Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Evangelical Theology and the Challenge of Classical Theism. My name is Gwen Dorsey, and I'm the Graduate Counselor for the Schools of Divinity, Counseling, and Social Work here at Karen University. I'm here with my colleagues, Dr. Keith Plummer, Dean of the School of Divinity, and Dr. James Dossil, Associate Professor of Theology here at Karen University. Before I turn over the floor to Dr. Plummer to lead us into this afternoon's conversation, I want to draw your attention to the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. Throughout the webinar, you are welcome to submit any questions you have for James and Keith through the Q&A chat, and we will leave some time at the end to address as many of your questions as we can. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Keith. Thank you, Gwen, and uh, welcome to all of you who are joining us. We're glad you took time out. Uh, I looked at the participant uh, list this morning, and it was encouraging to see that we've got people uh, tuned in from various parts of the United, United States, of course, but also some international registrants, uh, Uganda, Nigeria, Canada, United Kingdom, uh, the Bahamas. So uh, thank you all for, for joining us. I am here with my uh, colleague and good friend, James Dolzel. Uh, Dr. James Dolzel is the Associate Professor of Theology here at Cairn, and he is someone who has devoted a great deal of uh, time studying and contemplating the doctrine of God, theology proper. And some of the fruit of that reflection is uh, in his book, All That Is in God, Evangelical Theology and the Challenge of Classical Theism, published by Reformation Heritage Books in 2017, and uh, I asked James if he'd spend an hour with us today to talk about some of that book's content, and he graciously agreed. So uh, James, thanks for taking time out to do this. Dr. Plummer, thanks for having me. Well, um, would you mind if we started with the subtitle of the book before we get to the sure the uh, title, because and we can get into the the main title, but you call it uh, the subtitle Evangelical Theology and the challenge of Christian of classical Christian theism. So uh, two questions. First, would you take some time uh, discussing what you mean by classical theism? Sure. And then what are some of the challenges that you believe that it poses to contemporary evangelical theology that led you to write the book? Right. I, I should first say that I don't think that evangelical theology and classical theism um, are necessarily at odds with each other. Okay. Um, uh, coincidentally, they may be. Mm -hmm. uh, if evangelical theology takes its departure from classical theism, then they can be at odds. But there is nothing necessary in the traditional evangelical, and by this I mean broadly reformational doctrine of God that stands at odds with classical theism. Um, even if certain modern contemporary uh, the evangelical theologians stand closer or farther away from it. So okay. I should say that at the outset, this is not a necessary conflict, though obviously the word challenge in the subtitle indicates that I think that there is a, a bit of a conflict. Um, so first, classical theism, yes. what do we mean by that? Um, obviously there is no document that says officially classical theism includes um, this is really just an observation of what Christian theologians, um, East and West, sort of down the ages of the church have held to be true about God. And these are usually statements that have to do with God's existence, attributes, and his triunity. And so I put in the subtitle Christian theism because you do have classical theisms of the Judaic or Islamic sort that are not Christian uh, in the sense that they're not, they don't have any interest in the doctrine of the Trinity because they don't believe in it. So right. classical Christian theism uh, in terms of existence and essence uh, is, is firmly committed to uh, what I might sometimes call the confessions will call the absoluteness of God's being. The Westminster Confession says that God is most absolute. And it's this idea that when it comes to being, God is that one who is utterly irreducible in his being. In other words, putting differently, um, God, is not, God is not susceptible to causes or sources of being more fundamental than himself. So we might even say God is the most basic being, which is not an insult. Uh, it's more in the sense of 
of fundamental, the without which nothing, mm -hmm. um, but who himself does not need to, as it were, um, we don't need to dig down deeper to find some reason for God. God really is the reason for God. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, and a lot of um, particular doctrines about divine essence and the divine existence really flow out of this conviction of God's absoluteness and irreducibleness. So some of the ones that you will find, and when I say classical theism, I, uh, often people say the A-team, um, Athanasius in, in Alexandria, Egypt, or, um, or Augustine, also in, also in Northern Africa, or later on in the Middle Ages, someone like Thomas Aquinas, um, or just before him, um, someone like Anselm. But you could throw others in that, like like uh, Boethius or or John Calvin, if you will, mm -hmm. um, or the English Puritans would all sort of be part of that collective. Some of the doctrines that really um, stand out in terms of this divine absoluteness conviction uh, is a doctrine like divine aseity, which is sort of when I was in seminary 20 years ago, there was not a lot of talk about divine aseity. In the course of that 20 years, that language has sort of re-entered mm -hmm. Christian grammar. Um, and, and for those who, who might not be familiar with what that refers to. Okay, so divine, it's really a Latinism. Ose means of himself. When I when I teach our undergraduates here at Cairn and we introduce aseity, I always say, just think of it as God's of himselfness or the reason for God is God. God doesn't have a causal reason or explanation or source that isn't God or something more basic than himself that makes him. Would it, would it be accurate to say that this is like his absolute independence? Yeah, that's the negative way of putting it. So aseity is the positive way, God's of himselfness, but it also the, the corollary of that is God's independence, that God does not derive any aspect of his existence, attributes or operations from some cause. Um, creatures don't make God be, nothing not God makes God be. So yes, yeah, so independent in his being, uh, which is really due to the positive reality of being I am, uh, fullness of being. Um, so that would be that would be a common conviction among all classical theists. Together with that would be doctrines like um, divine immutability, uh, that God is not susceptible to change, does not undergo change. And again, for a very simple reason that all change brings to that which is changed a newness of actuality. In other mm -hmm. words, you to change, you have to not just be being, you have to be undergoing some becoming. Right. So God would have to have God would have to have actuality in him that was produced by whatever it was that accounted for the change in him. Uh, and in that respect, I mean, there's a corollary to that as well. That would mean that God is not infinite, uh, because in order for me to change into a state of being in which I'm not, I have to first lack that state of being. Mm -hmm. So that there would be the problem of privation, um, lack of being in God in order to give him a starting point by which to acquire newness of being. So this whole fullness of being and absoluteness thing rules out the idea of mutations or changes in actuality um, in God, and that would be a common that would be a common conviction. Other one, uh, just before, before yeah, you move on. That. So um, I know another word that you uh, have used frequently is the idea that there not being any potentiality in God. There isn't right. any potential in Him that is actualized. Um, could you just say a few yeah, words? Yeah, that's a good question because potentiality is really the condition or a, a necessary condition for actuality, but it's not the same thing as actuality. So uh, right now, um, you and I both have the real potentiality of standing upright, but as it is, we're seated face to face in this conference room. Mm -hmm. um, so that there's an that the actuality of standing upright is lacking to us right now. But in order for the actuality of standing upright to be actualized, there first has to be the capacity capacity to stand upright. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not a body, then you don't have the capacity to stand upright. Um, romantic love can't sit and can't stand because it's just not that kind of thing. So right. our, our natures give us um, actualities, but we're also loaded with potentialities. That is to say, um, possibilities for being what we currently are not. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, And that any movement into those actualities, so I'll just say it like this, to be potentially standing and to be actually standing are really not the same thing in you. Mm -hmm. um, and I can say that because you really are potentially standing, which really is not actually standing. Right. So God would have to be comprised of a set of principles of actualities and then also potentialities possibly actualized 
the difficulty there is if God actualizes what we call passive potency or some nowadays we might call potentiality, then you have a sourcehood problem, mm -hmm. uh, which is really um, if new actuality of being comes to be in God, then you have the question of what makes it so. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're, then you're looking for God's actualizer. Right. Um, now, some would say, well, I, I'm going to get off on a little tangent. Okay. Just indul indulge me. But, you know, right. you know me for enough years <laughs> to know me on uh, how I go with this. Um, couldn't we just say that God actualized himself like we are automobiles? I actualize the locomotive changes in myself by walking around from here to there. And um, but the difficulty with that is that if God were to actualize potentiality in himself, he would still have to, as the actualizer, have the actuality to give to himself. But then in that case, he would already possess it. Right. Um, unless God were composed of parts, namely partly actual, partly possible. Um, then you get into other problems. Then you have really distinct parts and components of the divine being that are more fundamental than the whole package. Um, okay. And so that gets into simplicity, but maybe we'll hit that in a bit. Um, I think another one that is that sounds strange to modern ears, and I don't deal with it in the book, though it's certainly a corollary of it, and it's a common feature of classical theism, would be a doctrine like divine impassibility. Mm -hmm. um, when I introduce this to undergrads or to grad students, I always always uh, try to set it up and say, look, I'm, I'm going to share with you the good news that God isn't passionate about you or about anything at all. Uh, and then normally you get some people are scandalized by the idea um, because to be passionate and to care about a thing seem to be one and the same thing. But that, but really, the reason the tradition denies passions to God, when I say the tradition, I mean East. East, West, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, mm -hmm. you know, across the board. The reason they deny passions to God is not because they think that God is like the God of deism, sort of just, uh, uh, you know, someone Static. who started everything and then stood back and is not in any meaningful way involved or intentional about his creatures. Um, it, it really is more precise than that. Passion is, passion literally means to undergo, mm -hmm. to, to be the recipient of some operation upon yourself. So what makes a passion a passion is not that it's an intentional state of mind, caring about your favorite team or the the, the one that you love or um, or the passions of pain, getting kicked in the shins and angry at the guy who did it. Um, it's not it's not the intensity of feeling, not the intensity that makes passion passion. It's really the the process by which you come to be that way. Mm -hmm. Am I? Did I fall in love? Did, was I moved to love by some lovely thing, you know, stirring up my my desire? Was I acted that. upon by something outside of myself in order to bring about this? Yes, and that's yeah. really it. All passions require a causal agent, that is to say, someone to actualize them. It also requires that the one with the passions actually be the recipient of the actualizing agency or activity of another so like when you look at a when you look at a an amazing uh, a tall mountain and you say mm -hmm. and you say wow and you're and you're you're moved to a state of awe mm -hmm. being in awe of a mountain is a real state of being but it's not a state of being in which i am all the time sometimes i mean i live on the east coast i grew up on the west i miss mountains and, mm -hmm. and even now when i see mountains i'm more in awe of them than i was when i saw them more frequently but what puts me into the state of awe is the awesomeness of the mountain itself. So there's a sense in which the mountain, by my perceiving it, is it's not a it's not intending anything because it doesn't have a mind, but right. it's still operating and actualizing an emotive or intellectual response in me to it. Mm -hmm. So that my state of being in awe. In some, if someone said, "Well, why are you?" You know, if you go up to Seattle and you see Mount Rainier. And when Mount Rainier is out on a, on a cloudless day, it, it's like nothing you've seen. And because mm -hmm. it's just one of these standalone mountains, it's not buried in a range. It really just is a glorious mountain. Um, when you see that and you are in awe, if I were to ask you, Keith, you know, we're walking down the street in Tacoma, Washington and say, look at the mountain. And you said, wow, that is just I am just in awe. I could ask the question, what made you be in awe? And the answer would be, perhaps among other things, but most preempt, the mountain made me mm -hmm. be in awe. The mountain. Uh, so this emotional response that I'm having, even to a mountain, is a passion to just the extent that it's a produced state. Mm -hmm. Well, if God, if all, if God doesn't have, if God is not a made-to-be thing, if God is not 
something that has causes or sources of his actuality causing him or making him. He's the maker of all, but not the made to be. If we say this, then we have to say that God has no passions. Not that God doesn't care, but rather that God's care is not a care that's produced in him by us. Right. So it's an intention. So his intentionality, like toward you, let's just say the love with which he loved you in Christ Jesus. That is a state of that is God being intentional about your spiritual welfare. Mm -hmm. But what we need to say is that that nothing not God is the cause and source of God's caring about your your spiritual welfare. OK, and so let's let's uh, let's stop there and then relate what you just said to the main title of your book. OK, all that is in God, because I think there's a connection. OK, yeah. good. So let's let's dial up to all that is in God. I like to say, you know, small book, big title. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a saying, and I actually gave I, I actually gave three um, little epigrams in the front of the book, uh, and I and I chose and I chose carefully here from different eras, starting from John Owen, who was a 17th century Congregationalist minister mm -hmm. in England. John Owen says about God, all that is in him is himself. Mm -hmm. Now, that's certainly not original with an English evangelical Puritan, uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, 13th century Dominican uh, friar, says whatever is in God is the divine essence. Or you could say whatever is in God is just God's godness. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's nothing in God that is not just his own divinity. Augustine, um, moving, moving centuries earlier and, and down into the North African continent, there is nothing accidental in God, and uh, not accidental in the sense of unintended, but accidental in the sense of something that isn't just himself that came upon himself. Mm -hmm. So like back to our sitting, for instance, you yeah. and I are both seated, but being seated is an accidental state of being, meaning um, it came upon us mm -hmm. about 15 minutes ago when we sat down in this room. Uh, right. and, and it's a state of being that when we leave this room, we'll leave us behind. So an accident is something real in you, but it's not um, it's not your substance. It's just something that attaches to you and characterizes your being for a time. Mm -hmm. So what we're, what we're saying about this is that with regard to God, there's nothing in God that is not God. That's the negative way of saying it. The positive way of saying it is all that is in God just is God. There's not something in God that isn't just himself causing him to be in a certain way, whereas there is in us. I mean, right. the state of the state of being seated, I just picked that one because it's visible, mm -hmm. is a state of being, I can say with all, with all, the full existential force that I can muster, Keith, you are seated. Mm -hmm. It is a real state of being in which you find yourself. There's a real existential weight to that statement. And nevertheless, it's a way of being that only came upon you moments ago and will leave, leave you again when you leave this room so that it's not a thing that exists in itself. It's a thing that only exists by attachment to you. Mm -hmm. um, what we're saying with God is that there's no state of being that, as it were, God receives through a process he undergoes. So this is really the full. It's, it's, a, it's another way of saying fullness of being. That right. what, what, so if we ask the question, why God? The answer in, an, in, in the final analysis is always because God mm -hmm. or God is the reason for God. Um, so that all the things we say about God, good, wise, loving, just, true and eternal. These aren't um, these aren't like a collection or a bundle of virtues that God happens to sort of hold together. Right. Rather, all of these are just different names for the same thing, namely Godness or so, divinity, as the older uh, writers would have called yeah, it. You, you are right in, in the book. Properly speaking, God is good by virtue of God, mm -hmm. not goodness. He is wise by virtue of God, not wisdom. He is powerful by virtue of God, not power. He is loved by virtue of God, not love. And when we say that God is goodness itself, wisdom itself, power itself, and love itself, we do not mean that these are so many really distinct parts or forms in God, but simply that he is all that is involved in these terms by virtue of his own divine essence as such. That's... Is that what you were... Let me just give full disclosure to our listeners. Okay. That is exactly what I'm saying. It probably took me more than a decade of my life <laughs> of, of you know, hitting this stuff in terms of the literature to, to even be able to come to a point where I could say that and, and, and with confidence. But I mean, what we're what we're saying is not that God is not wise, loving, just, true. It's all the other things we say about God. What we're saying is that 
these are not in God the way that similar virtues are in us. So I could say um, with regard to our friendship, and you and I have said this to each other as Christian brothers before, I can say, Keith, I love you. Mm -hmm. And you know, and we, you know, this love in the Lord that we share. And yet me and my love for you aren't the same thing because, uh, I mean, I know this because I was once me and I didn't even know you. You know what I mean? And and vice versa. So that so that the love that I have for you may be real and it, and it may be well grounded, particularly in the bonds we share in Christ Jesus. But it's um, it's a it, it's it's some the love I have for you is something in me in virtue of which I am loving in this mm -hmm. in, in our in our brotherhood in Christ Jesus. Um, and yet um, to be James and to be loving. Mm -hmm are not the same reality. And I know this, and you can ask people who know me well, and you know me well, and I'm not always James and loving. Sometimes I'm James and, well, not that, um, or not that as much as I should be. So that there's a real sense in which I have love mm -hmm. by God's grace as one, as a quality. Um, I have many virtues and attributes, but I am not those virtues and attributes. Yeah, none of those are identical with, with me. Yes. Yeah. For me to be, for me to be this man and for me to be like, say a husband mm -hmm. or a father or a friend or in the state of being seated or whatever mm -hmm. you want to say, all these things you can say about me um, to be this man and to be these other things are in fact, I they, they are together in me mm -hmm. as a unit. I really am uh, a husband and a father and a friend who is sitting and I'm all of that at once. Mm -hmm. um, and yet not and yet none of those things is identical with me, the substance, nor are they identical with each other. And this is really what we mean when we say um, that God has no parts. What we really mean is um, features of being or actuality that are um, that are um, less than the whole. Mm -hmm. And upon which the whole depends. Uh, right. So that what I really am as a whole is um, is sort of a collection of things that are substantially true of me and accidentally true of me. Um, and so that all that is like, for instance, all that is in me isn't human. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the state uh, like right now, I'm a husband. That's a relationship in which I stand. But being human and being husband aren't the same thing because right. I, I was once human and not a husband. Right. Um, I was once human and not a professor or mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So you started talking about simplicity, and I'm glad that you did that because you spend a, a good deal of the book dealing with that doctrine. And uh, you, you started to define it in terms of God not having parts. Now, I think for a lot of people who aren't familiar with the, the doctrine and its, its um, articulation over history, they, they would say, well, of course, God doesn't have parts because he's a spirit. Um, and where they're thinking of parts in terms of material yeah, bits. things that you, yeah, bits mm -hmm. that you assemble, that's not, well, of course that's true, but by God not having parts, uh, you mean more than that. Right. Um, right. And you, you started to get into that, but expound on that, particularly as it relates to this idea of um, God not being an assembly of attributes that make God God. And in the book, you say that if that were the case, God would be doubly dependent. Okay, so let's hit that. I, yeah. First of all, to any who might find that confusion, um, you're wrong, but I'm wholly sympathetic to your error because I think I I think I had that assumption for a good long time. I the language as it comes down to us in the Protestant tradition, you can find it uh, originally I think by Archbishop Cramner, the first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury. You find it in the 39 Articles of Religion of the Anglicans, the Church of England. You find it in the Westminster Confession, the, the Savoy Declaration, the Second London Confession. And it's this little phrase. The Lord our God is without body, parts, or passions. It's a it's a triple denial. But for the longest time, I think I read it as without body parts. <laughs> well, of course, because he's a spirit, and Jesus even says the spirits don't have bodies like like mm -hmm. we have. And then you know, after his resurrection, they thought they were seeing a ghost, but he said, you know, but touch me, see, I'm not a spirit. So I think I assumed, well, he's without body parts because he's a spirit. Um, and of course, that is actually one aspect of divine simplicity. Certainly, it means that God is not comprised of um, of uh, material bits, um, mm -hmm. you know, this connected to that in some sort like of organic, Legos or something. like Legos yeah. or yeah. like we or like you and I, where, yeah. we have a, where we have a skeletal system and a muscular system. And uh, we've got uh, anatomy and physiology and we've got a we've got a really complex where we are complex organisms. Mm 
made out of bits of tissue, of tissue, some of it very dense in the form of bone, some of it very soft in the form of, of well, my muscles have gotten softer over time, but you know, <laughs> d- dense and hard, and and other things too. Uh, some things pump blood. Uh, some I've got I've got things inside of me that that filter what I eat, and I've got all, and so it's all put together. Uh, even me materially, I am actually re- while I am a unit, um, and hopefully you know trying to function well, um, I'm reducible to a spleen and a kidney and a spinal column and a nervous system and a respiratory system and everything that's involved. And there are a series of various systems that all sort of cohere together. And I'm my well-being and my life is really dependent on all these things, none of which is a human. A spinal column isn't a human. A, a human heart isn't a human. It's a part of a human body. Mm-hmm. So one thing we should say, well, first of all, to the to the confession, the confession actually puts a comma mm-hmm. between body, body and parts. And part. So when it says body, it's certainly denying that he's that God is material in any respect. But when it says without parts, it's actually going farther than that. And it's simply denying that God, it's a way of denying that God is a dependent entity. So mm-hmm. your question about twofold dependency, we should say this, things comprised of part. And by the way, parts don't have to be material bits. Mm-hmm. In the age of modernity, where physics is king, we tend to, think we tend to reduce everything yeah. to quantity and matter. Yeah. And, that, and that is part, one of the things I like about teaching doctrine of God in a, in a kind of broad and liberal arts university setting is we, we really do get to place this queen of the sciences right here inside of the university system with all of the um, other sciences and sort of differentiate it. And the one thing that differentiates is um, the way of thinking in physics doesn't, which is fantastic. I love physics and all it's done for us, Mm -hmm. Um, air air conditioning and air travel Mm -hmm. and and elastic. I I like all of those things. But, But the idea that quantity and material bits and the laws governing their operations are really all there is to say about being and causality and change and and even composition, I think is a mistake. It's really materialism. Yeah. What we what, what we're denying when we deny parts is not just material bits outside of material bits sort of cobbled together, but what we're saying is. Um, that God is not comprised not only of physical bits, but even of metaphysical uh, of metaphysical parts. So, for instance, um, I'll just take um, I'll just take the instant. Let's just take a state of mind, a state of mind. Um, let's just take let's just take it the state of mind of ignorance and then the state of mind of knowledge, which hopefully displaces our ignorance at some point. Mm-hmm. Not knowing or being ignorant is a state of mind lacking the actuality of knowledge that's acquired through learning. But since, again, if we're not materialists, we don't just reduce our minds to brain function. Um, changing your mind, uh, having, a, having a change of mind, your mind is a part of you. Mm-hmm. It's not a material part of you, but it's a real part of you. It's mm-hmm. not all that you are, but it's, uh, it's an essential piece of what you are as a human. Right. Um, so that we are dependent not just upon physiological bits, But even upon things like the soul, which is not an extended thing in space, it's not a material entity. Um, So even our our bodies depend upon something that our soul gives to us that isn't just our body. So Mm -hmm. even here, you've got composition, body and soul, but it's not material composition. It's not it's not matter plus matter. It's matter plus spirit um, that are actually. So when we say parts, what we're really after is this, that there's a a, I, I try to reduce parthood to this. A part is anything that is less than the whole without which the whole would be really different than it is. Mm -hmm. And we should say two things then about parts. Wholes depend upon parts in order to be. And parts, just insofar as they are parts, do not actually possess the fullness of being that belongs to the whole. Mm -hmm. So wholes are greater than parts and wholes, uh, wholes are greater than parts in being and wholes depend upon parts, at least to that extent that they are parts for their being. Okay. The problem with saying this of God, when we're talking about physical or metaphysical parts, is that an entity composed of parts is not irreducible in being. That is to say, you can find a ground of being, a, a, a basis for its being that is more fundamental in being than the whole. Mm-hmm. So I'm, the easiest, you could pick a car and you could say, um, my car depends upon an air compressor for its air conditioning unit and and um, and fuel injectors and a draw and a and an axle and four tires and a steering wheel and all of these things contribute to the well-being and functionality of that 
composite, mm -hmm. multi-parted entity. But none of those things is my Nissan Altima. Mm -hmm. I mean, wheel, the steering wheels and fuel injectors and tires and all the things without which my Nissan Altima would either not be a car at all or would be a much poorer car than it is, um, would in fact be lost to it if any of the parts were lost to it. But none of the parts is a Nissan Altima. So there's a sense of which, and I just use that as an illustration, sure. but there's a sense of which things that are composed of parts are in, a, in terms of ontological basicality, are reducible to dependence upon, are reduced to dependence upon things that are not identical with themselves. Okay. If this were true of God, though, we would have to say that something that isn't just Yahweh or just, isn't just the one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, something more fundamental than God must be contributing to the being or the well being of God. He is in some way dependent upon. Those he would have points. to, so he would be dependent upon everything that's composed of parts depends upon the parts where it is composed, where mm -hmm. it, of it is composed. Um, that would be the first. Oh, and by the way, I think most Christians, if you press them a little bit, I think understand exactly why we can't say that about God because Romans eleven thirty six, for instance, says all things are from right. Him, through Him, and to Him. And uh, so many corollary texts will say that God is the absolute creator and the first cause of being. If you wanted an argument like Thomas Aquinas would give, he's the unmoved mover. He's the uncaused cause. He's not He's not a, a remarkably powerful caused cause. Mm -hmm. He's the cause behind which no cause, behind which no source. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we can think about that, we can realize that if God were composed of parts, that just couldn't be true of him. Um, he himself would depend on what is not himself just to be himself, in which case then he wouldn't be the first and absolute being. Um, he would himself be a derived being. Yeah, and you point out in the book how the, the consequence of that is that such a, a being is not worthy of worship. And not because he's not impressive. Right. But because he's not most absolute. He's not absolute. He, he could not be the – a God composed of parts – could not be the absolute first cause of being from whom are all things because he himself would depend on what is not himself to be himself as all things composed of parts are. Yeah. Um, so that that's the first dependence. Okay. Things composed of parts depend upon the parts where they are composed. Um, the second dependence is that there would have to be some, some what we call fund of unity, a, a source of unity, something would have to account for the togetherness of the parts. So mm -hmm. if you, if you went to a, if you went to the Toyota plant and you saw um, all of your, all of the parts there, there, there are, there are the bumpers waiting to be put on cars and there are the drive shafts and there are the, there are, there are the fuel injectors over here. And here are, I mean, in, in older cars, you have the carburetor, here are the mm -hmm. carburetors and here are the, you know, uh, everything that goes, in, I'm out of my league with this, but everything that goes into making a car a car. Um, the problem, though, is simply having the parts all under the same roof isn't sufficient. Mm -hmm. You got to have assembly. Some that they have to pass through an assembly line. Something, some agent has to impose unity mm -hmm. on the parts. So it's not so that the double dependency is this: things composed of parts depend on each part individually. And they depend on whatever is the source of the unity of the parts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or what would you say? A composer. Things right. composed of parts require a sufficient causal uh, cause of composition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is the problem. If we say that God's composed of parts, then we have to say there's twofold dependency. He depends upon parts not identical with himself, and he requires some ex extrinsic imposition of unity. Mm -hmm. um, it, even if we were to say, even if there were a junkyard, and a, and, a, and a powerful tornado were to blow through the junkyard and blow certain parts together just so as to form, um, you know, an F-22 fighter. Mm -hmm. Probability of that is extremely low, almost to the vanishing point of extremely low, though it's not strictly impossible. It's just almost impossible. Yeah. But even if it happened, I'm just thought experiment, even if it happened, and if you could point to this, you could point to this F-22 fighter, um, you would know that the F-22 fighter depended upon all of its parts to be an F-22 fighter, and it would also depend upon some power that imposed itself on the parts so as to unify them. Now, in this case, it wouldn't be an assembly line um, at, at Lockheed Martin or whoever makes the F-22. It would be um, a whirlwind that blew through a junkyard. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. there'd have to be a, a source of power in, that, that supplied the unity to the parts to bring cohesion to the to bring cohesion yeah. to the whole to make yeah. it a whole and i think this is the problem if we say god's composed of parts 
he's a he's a twofold dependent de deity. Yeah. In which case, then that basic Christian conviction that God is the absolute first cause of being behind which there is no cause or source of being just is no longer true. And simplicity is just an elaborate. Some people get sort of lost in it, but really. Simplicity is just a, an elaborate scheme. I like to say a good scheme, one mm -hmm. of those good and necessary schemes. It's an elaborate scheme to protect this core conviction that God is the reason for God, that God is not made to be or caused to be by that which is not himself. Right. Um, and if we can sort of lock onto that, then simplicity is just an elaborate scheme to make sure we don't compromise that. Okay, that's helpful. Now, I want to get to some questions. But before we do, I want to, um, well, actually, we can do this together, uh, get to some questions and get to another question that I had about the uh, subtitle, and it is this. In, in the book, you obviously believe that there are um, aspects of contemporary evangelical theology that have strayed from some of these doctrines that you said, and you've used the... You've used the term theistic mutualism, um, and you see that as something that is uh, to be guarded against. And um, briefly, and I know that's not even fair. Right. I can't say that's it. all right. Just, but I'll, but I'll so try, that we I'll can, try to abide. Can we, can we so that we can get to some questions that uh, some of which I think are related to this still? What is it that you mean by theistic mutualism, and how is it challenged by classical? Christian theism? That's a good question. So what, what I mean by mutualism is not the more general sense of that, 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 God, um, that God is the creator and we are immediately dependent upon him so that God is the immediate source of our being and we are immediately related to him as dependent upon him. Mm -hmm. if, if people mean by mutual, if that's what they mean by a mutual relationship with God, then I am completely on board uh, mm -hmm. with saying that. Um, I define it on the very first page of the first chapter, just to sort of say what I'm after with okay. mutualism. Um, I just say mutualism, as I'm using the term, denotes a symbiotic relationship in which both parties derive something from each other. In such a relation, it's requisite that each party be capable of being ontologically moved and acted upon and thus determined by the other. Um, so my concern here is, my concern here is, the, the mutualism of God does, God gives something to you and you return the favor by giving. So, so God, God gives to you life, breath and all things. And then you give something back to God so that God is both a giver and a receiver, mm -hmm. um, a both maker and a receiver of actuality. Yeah. A receiver um, in the, because someone might hear that and say, well, Certainly, he receives our worship. He receives, but what you have in mind, in particular, is a receiver in the sense that there is something new brought about in him. Yes. On on account of something that we have. And done. so, and then this is so, and that is exactly what I'm after. That there's mm -hmm. some new state of this is an actuality talk. I think is the most clear way to put it, even if it mm -hmm. sounds a little awkward jargon wise. Um, that there is some new state of is of actuality in God that is the product of the creature's doing. Mm -hmm. So the creature then would become the agent and God would become the, the, the patient, right. the acted upon, the receiver of our agency. And our agency would be producing states of actuality in God. Mm -hmm. And this is the difficulty. And what I, what I'm concerned with in the book, this is the, uh, some, uh, somewhere back, somebody complained about how this this book's polemical. I say in the introduction, this is a polemic. Uh, the, the word challenge is in the subtitle of the book, so I mean, this is not a um, this is not a purely positive. I'm trying to I'm trying to get in to a little bit of cut and thrust with uh, my my fellow evangelicals and even my fellow evangelical Calvinists, if you mm -hmm. want to put it that way. I think that they're not immune from some of these um, critiques and concerns. Um, there is this there is a, a sort of um, it's emerging and it's hard to sort of point the finger and blame a particular individual though certain prominent ones among them have advanced the idea that it's not so much that God doesn't change or that the creature isn't the cause of a change in God, um, but rather um, we should, in order to sort of say that God meaningfully responds to and in interacts with his creatures, we have to allow the creature to some extent to be an agent, they don't use the language agent, that's mm -hmm. fine, but to be an actor who operates on God in such a way as to produce some new state of being in God. 
Um, if you put it that way, of course, it sounds horrible. And that's usually not how it's presented, though I think that's what it amounts to. It's usually presented in terms of um, relationality and emotion um, that God that God is um, changing in his emotional state or disposition intrinsically toward us. Mm -hmm. um, so some theologians will say, um, one theologian has proposed what he calls um, relational mutability. And this relational, by the way, this is not a this is not a liberal theologian. This is not even an open theist. Right. Um, this is a conservative. This is a conservative Bible believing Calvinist mm -hmm. theologian who will propose, nevertheless, that God experiences relational mutability. And he's very clear that this isn't God changing the revelation of himself toward people in time and in space, that these are changes in his own words that are real in God. Mm -hmm. so, so that there's an intrinsic state of being in God that is, in fact, new, and the person and the one who produced it in God is the creature who acts upon God so as to produce these new emotional states. The, the difficulty with this, uh, first of all, it violates the law of simplicity because now God has to be composed of act plus passive potency, which would be really distinct and irreducible principles of being. Mm -hmm. um, so something more fundamental than God would have to be comprising God. But um, it also results in a state of being in God of which the creature is the cause of it. Mm -hmm. I think this is a problem. If God becomes one of the causers, but also caused to be, even in this non-essential sense of emotions or whatever, then what we're actually saying is there's actuality of being in God and the creature is its producer. Mm -hmm. um, which sounds scandalous yeah. in the way that I put it. I think it is scandalous, but it's... I think we need to to see it for the scandal that it is. Now, there's a there's an attempt, of course, to shore up liabilities of this, mm -hmm. saying that God is now caused to be to some extent by the creature um, sounds dangerous. Unless is there a way to sort of protect that from getting out of hand? And I think this is where sovereignty is being invoked in a in a sort of novel way mm -hmm. by a lot of modern theologians. Now that we've now that we've sort of changed the rules, God isn't strictly immutable. He can be relationally mutable and change his feelings intrinsically and even have you change his feelings intrinsically. Then it becomes then the question now is just negotiating um, primary authorship. Mm -hmm. In other words, do do I change God by an origination of my own will, or do I change God because God in eternity past yeah. chose for me to change him yeah. so that God ultimately, so what you have is you have God ultimately authoring and decreeing his own intrinsic mutations and selecting certain creatures to be the agents of change that produce changes of being in him. Yeah. So God chose freely to have creatures be causes of being within him. Mm -hmm. And the idea is if we can just make sovereignty this sort of um, a, a, almost like a kind of iron dome that we can just drop on top of this now mutable God, mm -hmm. um, we can protect it from going haywire. Um, as long as God is the one choosing his own mutations, um, then all is well. The, the, obviously, this has difficulties even with like divine infinity. If all change brings to that which has changed a new state of being that was lacking, you can't change into what you are. Like you are seated. You can't change at this moment into being seated because you already are. Already are. If God is infinite in being, then this newness of being that appears in him would actually re require as a sort of precondition that he not be infinite in being prior to the reception of you know, this new state of and I think some of these questions have not been thoroughly vetted yeah. by some of our our friends in the evangelical world who have who have proposed uh, these sort of um, mod and they will often call them very clearly these are modifications modified classical theism. Mm -hmm. My concern is that modified classical theism actually undoes the whole thing. It ceases to be classical theism. Yeah, it's, high. it's not modified yeah. classical theism anymore. Yeah. All right. I can tell already. We're going to have to come back and. <laughs> yeah, for, and for you and I, for everyone tuning in, this is this is an extension of an eight-year conversation. Yes, so. we're going to have to come back because I hear I can hear people saying, "Well, what about these passages of scripture, and what about um, uh, you know, those passages of scripture that uh, do present God as somehow responding and so forth?" So I, I'm not going to get into that because I do want to get to some of the questions that people have either sent in when they registered, or people have asked during the course of uh, our our talking. Um, someone says, it seems that classical theism is heavily dependent with a well-developed system of metaphysics and more. 
Uh, what books would you recommend for a student who is interested in developing their philosophical understanding and method for a proper uh, theology proper? So that's a good, that's a great question. Uh, give us two. Two. Okay. <laughs> Um, I will say this, uh, if you want to sort of get into the historic, Christian grammar historically did not eschew the language of metaphysics or being. Everybody, and by metaphysics, just I'm, for the sake by of... By metaphysics, I mean a, uh, a, a theory, I don't mean theory in the sense of, a theory of being, mm -hmm. um, a set of convictions about is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, everybody has one. The question is whether you've articulated yours. Okay. Um, and what I find is it's not a question of am I going to do metaphysics when I think about being. The question is, am I going to do it in a well thought out and coherent way or am I going to fly by the seat of my pants? Mm -hmm. um, and I think most of us fly by the seat of our pants until we become discontent with doing that. Mm -hmm. um, part of my book's objective is to make people discontent with doing <laughs> that. Um, so I would say two things. First, if you want to get into the historic Christian grammar, um, Richard Muller's Dictionary of Latin and Greek Scholastic Terms, uh, published by Baker. It's in a second edition, still in print right now. Richard M U L L E R. Richard Muller Dictionary. If you just if you just put that into Amazon, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you'll find it. Um, that's going to bring you into a lot of the sort of technical vocabulary with great encyclopedic entry, entries uh, explaining. I also like. I'm going to do three. I'm going to break your rules. Right. Uh, Bernard Woolner, W U E L L. NER um, also has a great dictionary, just to Woolner Dictionary, give you a great sort of summary of basic philosophical terms. As far as a basic metaphysics, Henry Koren, K-O-R-E-N, out of print for a long time, still around. It's just a sort of basic undergrad intro to metaphysics written in the 1950s. It'll be over most even graduate level person's heads, but it's a it is a fantastic sort of way into the doctrine. More recently, I'm going to go for Edward, oh, right. Edward Sk Phaser Scholastic Metaphysics. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Let me throw in some, uh, because I think, uh, and you've touched on this and you do in the book, um, but some people hearing this might think that this is just about philosophy. And I know your main concern is the, the theological import of this in terms of the church's worship, and how it is that we conceive of God, respond to him, and so forth. Let me throw together maybe a few questions, and you can take from them uh, bits that you, you want to answer. Uh, I don't expect anything exhaustive because I'm throwing a lot at you. But someone asks a good question. Um, what is the impact on both the academy and local church if these doctrines are not upheld? So that's, that's one question. Um, Another question that's of a, a practical nature is, um, can prayer change God's mind? Uh, I, I think that people hear the kinds of things that you're talking about, and they say, well, wait a minute. If God isn't acted upon by us in any way, then what, how does this work out? Right. Uh, so let's, let's do those, those okay, two. Okay, that's good. I think the first one is is simply the the value of this for the Christian is um, that this this further um, this further stabilizes the Christian's utter faith and dependence in God. Well, I, I put it it's a little bit cheeky, but I think it works for our purposes. In believing that God, for instance, is without parts, um, we can say you know in, in a modern idiom, God won't go to pieces. God won't fall apart. And the reason God won't fall apart is that God isn't composed of parts in the first place. There are no parts to fall into. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know that sounds cute, but I think there's a lot to this. In other words, God's utter dependency, God's utter dependency really comes down to his immutability and his irreducibleness of being that God is most absolute. So that if we receive all things from him, life, breath, and all things, and in him, we live, move, and have our being, ultimately our sufficiency lies in that whose sufficiency does not lie in another. Mm -hmm. So that I think in terms of the consolation, if you can I believe his word and can I trust him and can I be sure that evil will not undo him or overwhelm him, even if he means well, how do I know he's able to do well right where I personally am concerned? I think these doctrines are ways that add fortification to those foundations. Mm -hmm. um, and that's important. I, and I have I, I will say on a personal note, in teaching Sunday school classes 
uh, in, in churches, not full of theologians, but regular folk, as they say, I have been able to teach the doctrine of simplicity. I've had to slow it down mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, explain it and illustrate it. And ha but I have been able to sort of recover some of this traditional doctrine uh, in the hearts and minds of lay people. I think in a way, maybe they don't feel comfortable turning around and giving the explanation to the person <laughs> next to them. But at least that first level where you where you can see the importance of it and you and you take consolation in that. Yeah. I would say that on the first level. If you don't if you don't want to believe that God goes to pieces, then it's important we keep reminding ourselves that God isn't built out of pieces. Mm -hmm. Okay. God without parts is essential to our utter and uncompromised confidence in him. Uh second question was Can prayer change oh, God's yes, mind? That's a good which... Um, this is how I see prayer. Um, I see pr in some of ours, all things are from him, through him and to him. And insofar as he declares the end from the beginning and the ideas and everything in between and works all things after the counsel of his will, what role could prayer have? Um, the goal of prayer is not to change God. The goal of prayer is as an instrument by which we receive from God's hand. Mm -hmm. So we always pray. I mean, even when we pray, we always say, um, Thy not my will, but thine be done. We pray like our Lord incarnate when he prays this, not my will, but yours be done. We can bring our prayers and petitions and our concerns and pour them out before the Lord, um, not because God needs changing, mm -hmm. not because there's something better God could be doing or, or intending for us. And we're here to sort of help him will better, because mm -hmm. if we were changing God's will, what we're actually saying is there's a good state of willing yeah. in which God isn't. And I'm here to help him get there. Now, that's good. Like you and I have shared prayer requests with each other, sure. and I make my petitions known to you, and I ask you to intercede on my behalf. But I do that because currently you don't know my plight. You don't know my, my concerns, um, and you may not even know enough to be intentional about me. Yeah. So that I really am trying to move you from a state of non-intentionality to intentionality. But we can't say that with regard to God because there's no state of non-being in God that needs to be actualized. So what is prayer? Prayer is... I always ask my students, it's like, well, if God already ordains the end from the beginning, then why pray? And I and I like to say, look, if God if God has um, ordained the days for you before there was yet one of them and written them in his book, Psalm 139, 16, then why do you look both ways before you cross the street and eat your broccoli? You know, in other words, these are these are activities, these are instruments by which we preserve our lives and by which we receive the next breath that the Lord gives us. I look both ways before I cross the street and I eat my vegetables. Because I think both things are conducive to extending my lifespan. Yeah. Um, but I do not think that, but I do think that these in, these instruments, these means are part of what God ordains as the course of my life. Prayer is like that. Mm -hmm. Prayer is a means by which God ordains for us to receive those things he purposes for us. And it's no less meaningful than eating your vegetables and looking both ways before you cross the street. In fact, as an instrument, maybe it's even more meaningful than those. Yeah. That, that was well done in that short time. That, I felt guilty so even you asking said, that. That's a challenge for me. <laughs> well, we've, okay, here's, we, we've got to uh, close down. But here's what I want to suggest. At some point, I don't know when, would you be willing to kind of continue? Yeah, let's just let's just call this a part one. And, yeah, because uh, there were so many things. I had all these notes, and there were so many, like, like I wanted to get into hermeneutics and the relationship right. between biblical and systematic theology as it relates to these doctrines. Right. There were questions related to uh, those and other issues. I am sorry if we didn't get a chance to get to your question, but I am going to save them. And uh, with Dr. Dolzel's uh, agreement to come back, maybe we'll have a time where we'll just devote uh, the major portion to questions, particularly for those of you who have either read the book or heard this. Uh, James, thank you very, very much for uh, this time. It, it flew by like I feared and expected that it would, but it was so good. And I would love to uh, do this again. Thank you, Keith. And it'd be my pleasure to come back and do this again and, and sort of pick up and, and maybe hit some of those questions. Yeah. Thank you all who joined us. Um, before you leave, I'm going to turn things back over to Gwen, I believe. If Gwen is around. There she is. Yes, yes. That was definitely a very, very powerful conversation. And um, as Keith mentioned, we're just about out of time today, but before leaving, I wanted to thank James and Keith for their time today and to let you all know that Karen is offering additional resources like this webinar throughout the um, rest of the school year. And we'll be sending you a link 
of today's webinar in a follow-up email. And we encourage you to share it with anyone you think would benefit from the content. I also want to put a plug in for our School of Divinity graduate programs, the Masters of Arts and Religion, the Master of Divinity and Master of Theology. Keith and James are excellent examples of the caliber faculty um, our divinity students study under. If you would like to learn more about the School of Divinity graduate programs or any of our other graduate programs, you can visit our website to learn more or email admissions at karen.edu to speak to one of our counselors. We're also currently enrolling for Karen's graduate programs for the second half of the fall semester starting October the 26th. If you're considering furthering your education or interested in auditing a class, inquire today or email the same email address to connect with one of our admissions counselors. We are so grateful that you were able to be a part of today's webinar. We hope that this time has been very helpful to you and we look forward to having you to join us the next time. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.